What's up, everyone? I have a rather lengthy episode for you today that I've been working on for the better part of three months now on the man that the Texans believe is their new franchise quarterback, of course referring to Brock Osweiler, the savior of football in Houston as we know it, and the most hated man in Denver, Colorado at the same time. So before you watch this, just know that uh, this isn't me just cherry picking plays or glossing over bad tape to try to make a point. This is the result of two months of tape study on 156 individual pass attempts against six very, very different styles of defense. And when viewed all together in context, those 156 attempts form a lot of different patterns and trends that ultimately make a very compelling case, at least to me, that Osweiler is going to be a good quarterback in Houston. He might not be great right away, but he'll definitely at least be good. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm being all positive about this because I am a Texans fan at heart. So I'll start with the part of the seven game sample size that I really did not like. He's clearly inexperienced. Very, very inexperienced, I'd even say. Uh, and it showed at some really inconvenient times for the Broncos last year. There were some missed reads and missed throws that frankly are inexcusable. The one that immediately comes to mind is him getting a man coverage look, single high from the Raiders against a tight bunch from the Broncos receivers in the first quarter of that ugly loss to Oakland. Typically, if you get man against bunch, rub routes are about the closest thing to a guaranteed completion and a conversion on third down as you can get. All that chaos during the release makes it a whole lot easier for a receiver to spring himself free while his defender tries to mirror him through four other bodies. So pre-snap, he locked in on Jordan Norwood coming off the rub from Vernon Davis and Emmanuel Sanders, because more often than not, that's the guaranteed conversion. In his inexperience though, like I mentioned, he missed or maybe just forgot that on a play call like this, one of your downfield receivers is always going to be what's called an alert. An alert, in short, is basically a read you look for on a broken coverage or against a blitz. Sometimes it's a hot receiver from the slot, sometimes it's a guy running wide open down the sideline. Alerts are things that you have to notice after the ball is snapped that take immediate precedence over whatever you thought you read before the snap. In this case, Sanders coming wide open on a broken coverage was the built-in alert for this play. Or at least that's usually how West Coast offenses treat a streaking receiver in a rub concept. You'll more often than not, in these kinds of systems, have your pre-snap read on the rub receiver that you take 9 times out of 10. But if the defense really screws it up and lets your decoys go free downfield for whatever reason, miscommunication, someone falls down, anything like that, just take the alert and hit them for a big gain. Obviously, in this case, Brock didn't see that alert come free. That's a touchdown off the board in a game that ended up being lost by just three points. Now, I'm not saying that Osweiler missing that read and later missing another sure touchdown pass off a of play action further along in the game caused the Broncos to lose. I'm not saying that it was directly his fault that they lost that game. Quite the opposite, actually, and I'll get to that in a bit later. But him missing those two scores did not make it easier on them to put this game away in the second half. They needed those points, and he didn't get them. Now, to me, missing an alert like that is all about, like I said, inexperience. If you never took any reps as the backup quarterback, because Peyton Manning was notorious for wanting as many reps as possible, and if you never got any actual game experience, because again, you're behind Peyton Manning, then yeah, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of time to work on recognizing alerts for every single passing play in a new playbook against every single coverage you might face. Those kinds of subtleties really only get mastered after the game slows down for a quarterback, and I don't think I've ever seen a quarterback in the history of the league who's had the game slow down for him in his fourth career start, no matter what year of his career he's in. This kind of stuff is honestly just bound to happen to inexperienced passers at some point, and unfortunately it happened to Brock Osweiler right there. It happens to rookies every single year. And in Osweiler's case, he was basically getting his rookie indoctrination four years into his career. And boy, what an indoctrination it was. 
there were times when I honestly wasn't sure what the hell he was looking at because he would just completely not see receivers open downfield. There were snaps when instead of reading high to low, which in a West Coast offense is what you're supposed to do, he read low to high because he liked a certain look pre-snap and it backfired on him. I mean, he made a few boneheaded post-snap reads that really frustrated me, and I'm not even a Broncos fan. Great example of that from the fourth quarter of the Patriots game. New England was up by two touchdowns, so they were in a 3-3-5 nickel package on defense because they were anticipating the pass coming from Denver. 3-3-5 meaning three down linemen, three linebackers, five defensive backs. In this case, they were running with three safeties instead of three corners because Denver was rolling with two tight ends, and the Patriots likely think that their safeties are better at cleaning up against the run than their nickel and dime corners, but those safeties also give them better range in coverage than linebackers would as well. It's more about versatility in this defensive look than anything else. So it's second and 10, Denver's running what's known as a gun ace formation in some offenses, which is a formation where both tight ends are balanced on the line in three point stances, flanking both the left and right tackles. Osweiler's in the shotgun with his running back flanking him to the field side. The Patriots are giving him a single high zone look here, also known as a cover three. And you can tell it's cover three because the corners out on the edges are lined up with outside leverage against the receivers. If it's inside leverage, that's an immediate red flag for man. Outside leverage is always an indicator for zone. We'll get back to the defense in a minute, but the route concept that Denver is running here on offense is meant to attack a defensive look like this to the field side by creating what's known as a horizontal stretch as well as a vertical stretch. When you hear the term stretching the seams, this is what it has to do with. So the Broncos are running Vernon Davis up the number one seam to the field side, while Cody Latimer runs a comeback under his deep third corner, which is an absolute killer against cover three. Underneath all that, you got Demarius Thomas running a shallow cross, while Owen Daniels hitches up over the middle as a check down. If all of those routes are somehow covered, he's still got his running back leaking out to the other side for some yards after catch. So when you look at how the Patriots run their cover three, they use a lot of match zone concepts mixed in with traditional drop zones. I touched on what a match zone is in my last video on Reggie Raglan and Jalen Smith, so check that out if you want more uh, of an in-depth explanation of what those are. But in short, match zones are when defenders actively carry their receivers up or across seams based on how they release rather than just dropping to a spot and reading the quarterback's eyes. Think of it like a hybrid between man and zone that kind of helps defenses be less vulnerable to getting moved around by a quarterback's eyes and hitting the seams between zones. Because again, those seams are actively being covered at all times. However, with defenders carrying receivers all over these different seams, that does make it relatively easy for offenses to isolate whoever they want on certain matchups or against certain coverages because the routes themselves are now used to move the defenders, not the quarterback's eyes. That's the trade-off here. Once they know you're running a match zone, it's really easy to land a few big counter punches on offense if you know what you're doing and you can design some plays that exploit them. In Denver's case, match zone principles dictate that the curl safety here, meaning the safety that's in the curl zone, has to carry Vernon Davis up this seam to the high safety. If he lets Davis go, theoretically, that's an easy gain in that number one seam, which is exactly what match zones were made to stop. With him carrying that tight end, that means he can't buzz underneath that field side corner and take away anything underneath of him, which is typically what you see from traditional drop zones in a cover three when the safety is down that low. This is the horizontal stretch, and that's what makes the curl safety the first read for Osweiler on this play. He either has to go inside to carry the tight end of the seam or go outside and buzz underneath his field side corner. He can't do both. So match zone responsibilities tell him to leave that corner out to dry and take Vernon Davis. At the same time, we've got a vertical stretch developing with Owen Daniels and Demarius Thomas. This inside linebacker, Gerard Mayo, is now forced into deciding between staying with Daniels over the middle or coming down to carry Thomas to the field side on the cross. Again, match zones dictate that he has to carry Thomas because there's nobody to pass off to on that field side which gives the Broncos a huge matchup advantage from a speed perspective because that's a big 4-4 wide receiver against an inside linebacker. That's the danger of match zones for a defensive coordinator because they can very easily leave you with shitty matchups just like that one if the opposing team knows exactly how to isolate your weakest links. So here we are, horizontal stretch with Davis and Latimer, vertical stretch with Daniels and Thomas. It's second and 10. 
Osweiler's got options. The correct thing to do here is read high to low, like I said before, starting with that curl safety. As a quarterback, you always want to read further down the field first, and now that I've explained both what the Patriots want to accomplish on defense and how the Broncos plan to exploit that on offense, you're probably all thinking that Osweiler, following the high-low read principles, should take that deeper read off the horizontal stretch and hit the comeback for an easy first down. But he doesn't. All that time learning about match zones, picking the perfect concept to completely negate them, and Osweiler gets the ball smacked down to the turf because he held the ball too long waiting for Demarius Thomas, his lowest read, to come open while the higher read of the comeback was there way earlier all along for a first down. That is not acceptable. It's not acceptable at all. He thought he was going to have a wide open space with Thomas either matched up with a slower linebacker or, best case scenario, not covered at all, and he rode that pre-snap read all the way to the grave. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of aggravating shit that young quarterbacks do. They do it all the time. They look at what they've got pre-snap, and technically they're correct in their read. But once the ball's in their hands, sometimes they forget to just stick with their fundamentals, read it high to low, stop overthinking themselves, and just take the freaking comeback to Latimer. This was purely Brock Osweiler, in his inexperience, outsmarting himself. He thought he had something big with yards after catch against a good matchup, and it completely buried him because he didn't get the ball out downfield when he had a perfectly good chance to do so. Always, always read high to low, unless it's a play that's specifically designed otherwise. And you know what? Osweiler's probably smart enough to have seen this exact play on film after the game and know that he immediately screwed it up and that he should have been looking downfield first and then progress to the shallow cross if that comeback wasn't there for whatever reason. Even footwork-wise, while we're on the subject of negative stuff, Osweiler had a really rough beginning to his career. Against Chicago, first NFL start of his entire life, he was under siege all game. When young quarterbacks are getting detonated by pass rushers play after play, sometimes the feet can break down a little bit, and I did notice that with him. He's 6'8", we already know that, and with quarterbacks this lanky, Really anything 6'6 six, six or above, they tend to have slower, lumbering feet that can take them forever to get anywhere they want to be in the pocket. You look at a smaller quarterback like Teddy Bridgewater or Aaron Rodgers, maybe Derek Carr, and you compare their footwork to a big guy like Brock Osweiler, and it's remarkable how much quicker those small guys are. They're more nimble, their weight transfer is almost instantaneous near the top of their drop, and they can glide around the pocket with damn near minimal effort when pass rushers come free. It's gorgeous, honestly, but with someone as big as Osweiler, you're never gonna get that. He's going to be slower. That's just how it is when you play at that size. However, and this is a big however, for someone who is 6'8", he's got great feet. They might not be great by Teddy Bridgewater standards, but in terms of how I expect someone that big to look in a seven-step drop, he looks fantastic. You would never know that he's built like a power forward if you just looked at his drop from the waist down. You can tell that he's drilled and drilled and drilled himself to get those feet as quick as he possibly can in that large frame. And that speaks volumes about his work ethic. I really, really uh, re respect that about him because he clearly put a ton of work into his feet. That being said, back to the Chicago game, once he started getting lit up by Pernell McPhee and Willie Young, there was a bit of a breakdown and a regression in his lower body. As he stepped away from pressure, he let himself get a little bit wild. He wasn't as tight. His steps were bigger, more lumbering, less subtlety, and ultimately his footwork was more time consuming. He was trying to put as much space between himself and that edge rush as possible because frankly, his offensive line was completely incapable of giving him that space in the first place. You can tell that he drilled so hard to have good feet and all that polish started to erode a little bit once the bullets started flying in a real game. Great example of that fourth quarter against Chicago. He's trying to hit Demarius Thomas on a curl against off-man coverage. Willie Young comes off the slot and brings edge pressure against the right tackle. Osweiler clearly does not trust Michael Schofield to keep him clean. I don't blame him for that one bit because Schofield was arguably the worst tackle in the entire league last season. So he takes a huge, huge step to shift away from that pressure and give himself space. A bigger step than he needs to, honestly. He basically wants to put an entire zip code between himself and whoever Schofield happened to be blocking on every snap. Which at this level you can't really do because it costs you a lot of time to take a step that big. Osweiler takes four whole steps to reset himself before planting his foot and driving the ball in the fifth step. 
when he could have and should have, honestly, just very quickly and subtly slipped underneath that pressure while maintaining his balance and control and gotten the ball out on his third step. One step to get away is all he needed, another to reset his hips, and a third to drive it downfield. That's all he needed to do. So he took two extra steps, one of them being gigantic, five steps total to get the ball out, which if he didn't do that, he could have hit Thomas on time as he had a couple feet of separation out of his break. Instead, he makes him go to the ground as the corner is just catching up to the route and it falls incomplete. He had to rush his throw because he was late and he was late because he was going through those extra steps to get space he didn't even need. That caused the inaccuracy, it made it a harder catch than it needed to be, and the corner was let back into the play by the time the ball even got there. Two extra steps when you lose control of your feet is the difference between an incompletion and a first down in this league. Believe that. So all that being said about mental and physical frustrations, the inexperience leading to bad post snap reads or sloppy feet, he's awful, this signing has bust written all over it, why the hell did the Texans do this? He can't handle pressure. He holds the ball too long, right? No, not really. Because as much as this Chicago game made him abandon his clearly well-practiced footwork at times, when I look for those same inconsistencies in later games, they weren't there. They weren't there at all. After the first start, he fixed his feet under pressure. He very noticeably had a better feel for edge pressure, how to maneuver himself through the trash, it was really kind of uncanny how much he improved in just one week. I think he went back to Denver, looked at the film, saw his feet get wild, and made a concerted effort to never have that happen again. To me, when I see such a huge difference in how he handled pressure one week and how he handled it every other week thereafter, that speaks about his willingness and his ability to improve. He got better, and keep in mind, he was sacked five times by the Bears in part because of how he moved in the pocket. But for a young quarterback who was facing his first action, seeing actual, tangible improvement is huge for me. It's absolutely huge. You look at the Patriots game or the Raiders game where he was also sacked five times by Khalil Mack, and he would have been sacked even more than that had he not been very good at handling the pressure with his pocket movement. If you just look at him maneuvering through the trash from the waist down, you'd never know that he was 6'8". It was a night and day difference and I really credit him for working hard to correct his mistakes. Back to the mental side now, the, the iffy reads and near-miss throws were a constant throughout his seven starts, and I mentioned those before. Those did not improve at the rate that his footwork did from week to week, as sad as that is to say. Whether it was sticking too long on his first read that was already taken away, rushing through his reads, or just flat out missing somebody wide open, we saw all of those. But while I do talk about his improvement on his feet, I want to mention that just because he had some painful missed opportunities from the mental side does not mean that those mistakes defined him. For every bad play that I charted that was all his fault, he had three or four very good ones that deserved just as much attention and praise. There were some throws he made in pressure situations against New England and Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, all the other Super Bowl contenders coming out of the AFC. He made throws against them that were just outstanding. So yes, he did screw up sometimes, all young quarterbacks do, but anyone who thinks that those mistakes were the sole reason for Denver's offensive problems is sorely mistaken. On the whole, the only reason why this offense was even in position to beat the Patriots and the Bengals in the first place was because of Brock Osweiler, even with the mistakes he was making. After he fixed his feet and really got into a groove, he combined that with good arm strength, veteran level eye discipline some fantastic ball placement to make throws that honestly won them games. Fourth quarter against the Patriots, they need a touchdown and they need it now. He looks off the high safety, drops it right in the bucket on the other side for Emmanuel Sanders, perfectly placed in the snow, in the clutch, in prime time against arguably the best team in the league and the best quarterback ever. He never melted under pressure, not once against the Steelers. They may have lost this game, but he uncorked a few passes that just made you say, wow. Another one to Sanders down the sideline, put where only his guy could get it. Very next snap, finds Demarius Thomas down that same sideline. Well placed again, but it's incomplete because Thomas can't keep his toes in bounds. It goes down as an incompletion, but that's a great, great throw. Even against the Raiders, another game they lost. 
he dropped some absolute dimes downfield in the fourth quarter that his receivers just couldn't hang on to. His feet were great to get away from pressure, and he'd place the ball perfectly down the field, but the drops just kept putting them behind schedule, and they kept killing drives. He may have missed two touchdowns in the first half, but his receivers and offensive line were the reason they lost that game. Khalil Mack sacked him three times on third down in those final two quarters because of that offensive line, which was honestly well below league average, especially at both tackle positions. And one of those sacks from Mack was on a three-man rush. In addition to that, Demarius Thomas and Vernon Davis contributed two drops that each ended drives, and Thomas ended yet another drive on third down with a fumble that Oakland recovered. Hell, Demarius even dropped a sure touchdown at the end of the first half that Osweiler put right on him. And if he held on to it, they probably would have won that game. So no, it's not all Brock's fault. Blame him all you want, but he's not the source of the problem. He made some rookie mistakes as a fourth year player in his first starts, yes. But without him, I'm not even sure Denver wins the division, let alone gets the first seed. That's how inconsistent his supporting cast was. I don't even know how Demarius Thomas got 1,300 yards to begin with last year because in clutch situations, he just could not hang on to the ball. Were it not for Emmanuel Sanders, Owen Daniels, and their otherworldly defense, Osweiler would have been screwed, absolutely screwed. He couldn't rely on his offensive line. He couldn't rely on his very expensive number one receiver. His running back core was average. People want to say 18 million is too much for a quarterback with only seven starts under his belt. But you know what? If you put that young, inexperienced quarterback on Houston's roster last year, mistakes and all. I'll tell you what, they would not have gotten blown out by Kansas City in the playoffs, and they would have won a hell of a lot more than nine games. At least in Houston, he has a number one receiver in DeAndre Hopkins that can hold on to the ball, an offensive line that can pass protect, a head coach that has a solid gold reputation for developing quarterbacks. He's got everything. All the Texans needed to be a Super Bowl contending team in 2015 was a passer that didn't wilt under pressure, and that's Brock Osweiler. They needed someone who will take a shot to the ribs, get back up, and throw a rope down the sideline on the very next play for a big game. They needed someone who shows improvement in handling pressure from start to start, rather than looking completely lost in the pocket all year long like Brian Hoyer. They need someone with a work ethic to fix his mechanical shortcomings, unlike Ryan Mallett. They need someone with good natural arm talent, unlike TJ Yates, someone with youth and long-term upside, unlike Brandon Whedon. Brock Osweiler literally fits every category that the Texans need at quarterback. He may have made some rookie errors as a fourth-year player that Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota made as first-year players, but he showed the same kind of promise that those two guys showed as well. He had the feet, the arm, the intelligence, and despite a wonky Philip Rivers-ish release, he had the accuracy as well. And believe me, I wish the release could be tuned up too, but I think at this point it just kind of is what it is. But my point is this, this is a guy who was given $18 million a year because when the chips were down against some of the AFC's best teams, he wasn't scared. He had his team in position to win every single one of those games. And some of them they did and some of them they didn't. But he never, ever got scared. For the first time in his career, the spotlight was all on him and he rose to that challenge and he fought through some ugly moments to get his team into the first seed in a stacked conference. That's what we call intangibles, folks, and he's loaded with them. Denver got outbid, thinking that they could get Osweiler for cheap because of his inexperience, but the Texans front office saw the same things that I did. They saw the same things that the Denver front office did. John Elway and Gary Kubiak expected Osweiler to take less money out of loyalty, but you know what? When he was benched in week 17 for a bunch of turnovers, that weren't even his fault because his supporting cast let him down yet again, I'm sure he didn't feel like the Broncos were being very loyal to him either. So he took the money, he took the better supporting cast, and he took the head coach with a better track record for developing quarterbacks. It's not exactly a coincidence that Ryan Fitzpatrick and Brian Hoyer improved their touchdown and interception percentages by 42 and 40% respectively once they got to Houston. It's not a coincidence that TJ Yates was able to beat the Bengals in primetime under O'Brien's tutelage, or the fact that for the first time in years, Brandon Whedon actually looked like a viable quarterback with a win on the road against the Colts. This is what O'Brien does. He makes bad quarterbacks decent, and he makes decent quarterbacks great. So when you throw in more money, 
a better offensive line, a more reliable number one receiver, a more explosive starting running back in Lamar Miller, and an offensive draft plan that gave Osweiler as many weapons as humanly possible. Well, no shit he chose Houston. I would have too. The Broncos were mad at his decision to leave because they knew what they had in store for the future with him in their building. And the Texans are now ecstatic because they know what they have in store in their future. 18 million or not, small sample size or not, this is a good deal for everyone except the Denver Broncos. Brock Osweiler has got more weapons than he knows what to do with, better protection than he's ever had, an offensive genius of a head coach, and an elite defense that can still cover him just like the Broncos defense did as he continues to develop and the game continues to slow down. This is the best situation Osweiler could have possibly hoped for. And to be honest, he might be the best quarterback Houston could have possibly hoped for in 2016 as well. Will he put up 4,500 yards and 35 touchdowns like Blake Bortles? No, probably not. Can he pass for 4,000 yards and throw 28 or 29 touchdowns and for once in Texans history be a quarterback that doesn't flinch when the pressure's on? Absolutely. And for a roster with this much talent on it, that's all they really need out of him to win a Super Bowl next year. Now that same game plan worked in Denver literally just last season. So in summary, is this a good signing despite the price tag? Yes. There will be some growing pains here and there. But Brock Osweiler makes the Houston Texans a legitimate contender in the AFC. This is going to be a fun team to watch. I promise you that. All right, that's all I got for now. Uh, I'm going to avoid doing any quarterbacks for a while because they take so much time and I'm losing my voice just by the end of recording this. Uh, I'll do some other positions in the meantime, but... I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe, and if you want to support the channel beyond that, I have a link to my newly minted Patreon account in the description, but that's all up to you. Uh, with enough donations, I hope to be able to do this full-time and release a new video every single week, rather than every month or two. But uh, regardless of what you do, thank you so much for watching. I do this for you guys. Uh, and until next video, later. Later.